Today we're going to talk about how our buying decisions are oftentimes influenced by context and after we buy products how we're going to go about using those products and disposing of them. So first uh, let's make clear that uh, purchase decisions while they happen all the time they are also influenced by many factors right not only the way we are our personality interests affect our decisions but there are also contextual factors that change from situation to situation and they makes us uh, make decisions that are very different than the ones that we have made in the past so today we're going to talk about those, some of those factors that are going to be changing and how they impact uh, our buying experiences so first uh, let's break those uh, factors into three big buckets right uh, some of those factors that are going to influence our buying experiences are going to happen before the buying right and we're going to call those antecedents right something that happens before right? uh, things like what is the context in which that uh, product or service is going to be used right uh, how much time do i have in my hands to make the decision or how do i feel about time that time uh, what is my mood am i in a good mood and because of that maybe i'll take longer uh, and maybe i'll ask others or am i in a bad mood right and also how do i feel about shopping some people love shopping right and some people hate it right so all those are gonna make the whole uh, shopping experience very different and then we're going to talk about factors that influence uh, the actual purchase on the spot right so we're going to talk about the shopping experience overall right we're going to talk about uh, things that we actually either observe smell or sense in general at the point of purchase right so what do marketers do sometimes to influence our purchase decisions on the point of purchase right on the store location website whatever it is right and also maybe uh, we're going to talk a little bit about salespeople, right because they might play a big role especially when you're talking about certain products like cars or homes right and then finally uh, we're going to talk about what do we do after the purchase right what is the role of satisfaction for example right what happens when we are unhappy right how do we go about getting rid of the product right what are the different options that we have and what are other ways in which we can actually maybe not only just recycle or you know dispose completely of the product but maybe sell the product right use alternate markets to maybe provide a second usage opportunity for a product that we are no longer interested in using at that time okay so first let's start talking about usage context and this is absolutely crucial right and uh, we buy things but we buy things and we also purchase services and but we don't do it because it's fun for the most part for some people it is and uh, we do it because we're trying to achieve a goal and because of that the reason that it's underlying uh, our purchase is usually a usage occasion right so for example here you have a, a diagram that outlines uh, different situations for which you might consider using sunscreen right so you don't always use sunscreen for the same reasons right it is very different for example when you are uh, i don't know going to the beach right like you have here in the first case okay versus when you're going maybe uh, skiing right something that i love to do but i don't get to do a lot right so in fact i love both right the, both the beach and the skin okay but what i'm going to be looking uh, for uh, in the product in this case sunscreen is going to be different depending on what my usage occasion is going to be also to add more excitement to the story it's also going to depend who's going to be using the product right so in my case i do have kids right and i have a wife i don't know how she puts up with me but i do and then it's me right so we have three different potential customers or in this case i will say maybe segments right that are going to be looking maybe for slightly different 
uh, benefits depending also on what kind of usage they are going to do for the product, right? So if it's for my kids, I'm probably looking for maybe a maximum protection, right? Why? Because I don't want them to burn. Maybe they are so busy playing with their friends that they don't notice that they are burning, right? And they are getting a bad burn maybe in their shoulders or their nose, which, you know, happens easier, it seems. And because of that, I'm going to put an extra uh, importance in uh, protection. Whereas, I don't know, if it comes down to me, maybe something that it will be more important, especially if I'm at the beach because I like to get in the water is whether the product uh, is water resistant right so do I have to apply it every time after I get into the water right? and which is obviously something that I don't care about whenever I go skiing because I mean unless I fall a lot and it's a really hot day and there are lots of puddles which hopefully you know neither of which neither of those situations actually happen and I, I really don't care about how waterproof the sunscreen uh, is when I'm in that usage context right so usage context and who's going to be using the product are going to really uh, uniquely determine what is uh, attractive in that product and because of that if you're a marketer you're going to have to be looking for specific product attributes that make sense for that usage context so not everybody's looking for the same benefits because you have different customers, which we have already talked about plenty, right? So that's the segmentation idea. But here, the next idea is even for the same segment, the actual benefits are going to change depending on the usage, right? In the context that is going to be used. And this is something that if you miss, uh, that's a big opportunity to create new products and increase the level of satisfaction of your customer. But not only the context matters, uh, also who is around us matters, right? Uh, which is interesting. And our physical surroundings in general. So every time you go to a store or to a restaurant, right? One of my favorite activities that I don't get to do as much as I used to when I didn't have little kids, right? Although my kids are not that little anymore. Anyway, um, it's going to a restaurant, right? And what affects uh, your experience in a restaurant? Well, it's everything, right? It's the lighting, the music, smells, right? The decoration, okay? Everything is part of an overarching experience. In fact, this is why you go to Starbucks and pay so much more money than if you buy coffee at McDonald's, right? And in fact, this was, uh, by the way, I don't drink coffee, right? But my wife was telling me that she was uh, pretty surprised about how good the coffee at McDonald's was. Right? She didn't expect it to be as good. Uh, but whenever I go to coffee with my wife, we never go to McDonald's, even though she likes the coffee. Why? Because the experience overall is not the same as going to Starbucks, where you have nicer decorations, maybe you have some couches where you can sit. And none of that experience is actually present in the McDonald's. Right? So it's not just the product itself that is determining how we feel about the experience is the combined overarching set of situational elements that really create that sense of, I don't know, in the case of Starbucks, uh, being in a comfortable place, right? In fact, the original idea was that, you know, you have home, you have work, and then you have Starbucks, which is what they call the third place, right? This kind of in between where, you know, you are relaxed, it's comfortable, and uh, you have what you want, both food and drink, right? <laughs> but also, uh, where you maybe can conduct business. In fact, if you go to Starbucks, oftentimes you will see people doing interviews that, I mean, I've seen a number of job interviews at Starbucks, right? Which, you know, we feel bad for the candidate. So all these factors combined together create a unique uh, service in this case, right? That it's, it's really going to change depending on what the decor is, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not only that, who is around you, your co-consumers, also are going to determine how you feel about the experience overall, right? So, for example, when you're looking for a restaurant, right, and let's just say that you don't know anything about the restaurants, you can actually use the number of people that are at the restaurant to gauge how good the restaurant is. And the idea would be like this, right? If nobody's there, it's usually a sign 
or at least we take it as a sign that probably the restaurant is not that good, right? I mean, it may be that it just gets busy at a later time, but we don't know that, right? If you don't know the local uh, customs, for example, if you go to Spain, one thing that will happen is if you go to a restaurant for lunch, let's say around noon, which you will think here in the U.S. is prime time, uh, you will find that there is nobody at the restaurant. And the reason why is because noon is way too early to eat lunch in Spain. Most people eat, let's say, between 1 and 3 p.m., right? So 2 p.m. is probably prime time in Spain. So if you get there and you find nobody, you might think, oh, this restaurant's actually not good. Whereas, you know, in this case, the, the information that is conveyed to you is maybe not necessarily true, right? But we use that information all the time. Um, also, not only how many people are there, but how do they look? Uh, how do they look like also matters, right? So, for uh, for example, if you go to a, a nicer restaurant, but everybody is dressed sloppy, um, you might assume that maybe the restaurant's not worth it because people are not dressed in a way that it's in accordance to what you will expect for the overall uh, experience at the restaurant, right? So not only we use the number of people that are around us as information to make evaluations about the uh, place, stores are the same, by the way, uh, but also who is there and how do they look like uh, matters to, in the overarching experience that we actually have uh, with the store or in this case, we were talking about the restaurant, right? Good. So we've talked about context. We've talked about the overall experience, the core, etc. And time also matters, right? So how much time we have and how we feel about time really changes uh, our uh, buying experience, right? So different people feel about time differently. Time is actually a fascinating concept, right? If you're a physicist, you'll tell me that, you know, time is this or time is that. But most of us, A, are not physicists and and B, we have all experienced the fact that time seems to have very different uh, connotation for us depending on how we feel about what we're doing, right? So when you're listening to this lecture, maybe you're counting the minutes until it's done. And because of that, time seems to pass slowly. Whereas, I don't know, if you're with your buddies having a beer, of course, if you're over 21, uh, you're probably enjoying yourself and time seems to fly, right? So... The way we feel about time uh, is very subjective in understanding that a uh, time component is actually important for how we interact with customers and for the overall shopping experience, right? So that's time overall. Second part is, uh, it seems like in modern times, and I'm talking about now the 21st century, everybody is time strapped, right? And in fact, if you think about it, time is one of the few things that you cannot buy no matter how much money you have. And one thing that you will see is that as people have more money, uh, they tend to hire people to do certain jobs so that they have more time for themselves, right? So this concept of time poverty is how do we feel about time in terms of how much free time we have or how much time we have for ourselves. And every study will show you uh, that if you go back in time, uh, uh, people used to feel less pressured for time. And the main reason why is because they had less good alternatives in which to spend their time. So right now, uh, we live in a situation in which because of technology, we have access to all sort of entertainment and uh, all sort of hobbies and all sort of products that can enable us to just do something with our time. So because of that, because there are more activities that are competing for your time, it's not just work and, you know, getting the chores done, there is other options. And I think because we have more choices, we want more of that time, so we feel more uh, pressure for time. And that's going to have an influence in how we go about shopping, for example. So how does that affect our shopping experience? Well, it depends on what our view of time is, right? So for some people, uh, and by the way, this is a study based on women, but I suspect a lot of these factors will apply uh, if you were uh, to actually do the same study in men. Uh, but I haven't seen the same study in men, so I don't know, right? Um, but it's just a guess, right? Uh, there are different aspects of time that matter. One is 
uh, who is the the central focus of the activity right is it me time or is it time that I spend with others and by the way uh, depending on your personality for example this is going to be a big uh, determining factor of how you feel right uh, if you're an introvert uh, you usually uh, want to spend more time on your own right so more me time um, whereas there are some people that are more extrovert we've talked already about personality right uh, and in that situation uh, you're going to want to spend more time with others because when you are with others you just feel better right so this distinction is going to actually influence uh, how you see every activity right shopping is the same right uh, if you care about me time uh, right you are more likely probably to shop online why because you don't want necessarily to be with others while you are shopping right and you know the ultimate way of uh, shopping on your own is shopping online right where you don't even have to necessarily interact with the person that it's helping you at the store right on the other hand if uh, you are more of a social creature which is totally fine and you see time as something that you want to spend with others then probably going to the store is actually more thrilling to you because you're going to get to interact with more people okay and you're going to be surrounded maybe by people right? same thing temporal orientation right some people are looking at the past some people are looking at the present some people looking at the future we all know what those three concepts are but you know it seems like uh, as you know we mature uh, we kind of look more at the past, right? We tell stories about how things used to be. If you talk to your grandma or your grandpa, if you're lucky enough to still have one of them around, um, they probably will talk to you a lot about the past, right? So for them, a very important part of uh, their day is this nostalgia about how things used to be, right? We've already talked about nostalgia and marketing, so don't want to talk too much about that. But if you talk to young people, it's the opposite, right? You talk to kids, they are talking to you about what they are going to do, right? Not what they've done already, not what they are doing, right? But you can actually tell that over time, we actually do change our orientation. And some people uh, are more future-oriented than past-oriented, depend regardless of uh, how old they are, right? Good. Planning orientation, right? Some people are planners, some people just, you know, uh, hate planning, right? Uh, like me, I, I, I don't like planning, right? Uh, whereas my sister-in-law, uh, she's always planning a year ahead what's going to happen, right? And, and that's going to change a lot how you go about shopping, right? I am somebody who ends up buying tickets for a vacation uh, a couple of weeks before the vacation, which is not smart financially, by the way. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, I also last minute buy things to try to surprise my wife, right? Because I'm not a planner. So I might buy flowers just because, right? And whereas if you're a big planner, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe you already have all the, you know, purchase occasions uh, determined uh, from the beginning, right? And you've done all your homework. And then lastly, uh, this whole idea of multitasking, right? Remember, uh, when we're talking about multitasking, we're just moving quickly from one activity to another. We don't actually technically multitask but uh, some people enjoy it in fact you can see that uh, with the younger crowd maybe you're one of them who likes to have their tv screen playing something a movie or whatever then they have their phone on the other hand and geez i don't know maybe the music playing at the same time right so you are literally uh, shifting your attention between these three activities right and some of us prefer focusing on one thing and spending more time on that and by the way, gender matters for this. It seems like females are more, uh, they lean more towards multitasking than men. Um, and of course, that's going to impact how your shopping experience will actually be scheduled and created. Right? Now, not only all these uh, situational factors that we were talking about are going to impact your, your purchase experience, but also everything that happens at the store uh, it's going to determine how your shopping actually is going to go. And that includes things like the layout of the store, right? So what do you do, for example, as you put sometimes the items that are more commonly purchased at the end of the store to make sure that people walk through the rest and maybe find new things. Uh, 
that happens, for example, in restaurants, sorry, in restaurants, in uh, grocery stores, right? For example, in Spain, uh, the most commonly purchased item at a grocery store is bread. And because of that, the bread is always at the end of the store. With hopes that as you walk through the aisles, you'll find other things that you're interested in, right? Um, but not only the layout of the store, but also uh, any stimuli that you find at the store. Things like music, right? Uh, slow tempo music makes you walk slower through the store. And because of that, you tend to spend more time at the store, right? And also salespeople, right? Especially with large ticket items where salespeople actually make sense. We'll talk about this a little bit later. So how do we learn about how consumers feel about their shopping experiences at the stores, right? There are different techniques we can use, right? Um, you can ask customers, right? Whenever you're in doubt, asking customers is a smart thing to do. So you could use a questionnaire. The problem with questionnaires is that quantifying some of these issues might be hard, especially at first, right? So oftentimes when you're talking about shopping experience, what you will do is you will use more qualitative techniques, right? Like a focus group, for example. Now, what is a focus group? A focus group, if you don't know, is where you sit down a set of, in this case, shoppers, right? And together uh, to discuss a certain topic. In this case, it will be, for example, how do you feel about the layout of the stores, whatever store you're interested in, right? Or how, how is your overarching uh, shopping experience? And you usually have a moderator, it's usually a trained person. It could be a psychologist, could be a sociologist. It could be somebody who has a lot of experience doing interviews. Um, and usually you'll have between six and ten people that are being interviewed simultaneously. And the idea of having a group instead of individuals is to try to leverage the interaction between the consumers, in this case the shoppers, to try to basically spark a conversation about how they feel about you know, certain practices, right? For example, how do you feel about self-checkouts at uh, grocery stores, right? So, and then maybe you can, you know, uh, get to more insightful uh, comments by just having the consumers talk to each other about their experiences instead of only having somebody asking you questions. Now, that's one possible technique. Um, another perspective uh, in how to gather information other than asking customers, is actually trying to live a day in the life of your customer, right? Having a customer journey, which is the idea that as a manager, right, as somebody who's trying to design maybe new experiences, what you do is you try to put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and see if you can identify what the pitfalls are, how you can improve the experience, etc., etc. Now, uh, a lot of the thoughts behind this come from uh, the engineering uh, story, right? Sorry, the engineering discipline, right? Uh, there's a whole discipline in engineering called total quality management that tries to find what the faults are uh, and how we can improve them. Right? And within that whole literature, uh, there is a whole branch that started in Japan that is called Gemba, right? And Gemba is a technique where you essentially do what I just described, right? You basically go to the true source of information. And instead of asking somebody, what you do is you try to live that experience. Uh, so how could you do that? Well, let's say that you're Toyota, right? Toyota, who is a company that has been building reliable, functional cars for many years. Yeah. Let's say that now you want to create a sports car. Maybe uh, it's hard for your engineers to actually understand what it, it really means uh, to be sporty, right? When it comes down to a car, it's not just about zero to 60 times. It's about how the car feels when you drive it. So because of that, what you might consider doing, maybe, is you might take a set of your engineers and designers, you send them to Germany, which is what Toyota did, by the way, and you have them... Uh, basically test drive a bunch of cars on the outer van, right, where the cars are going at fairly high speeds, right, at least in the por portions that are uh, in the autobahn with no speed limit. Some of them have speed limit. 
and that's experience that is hard to replicate in Japan, for example, and unless you are in a circuit or a racetrack, which is a very different environment than the auto van, right? So if you're trying to replicate that experience, you literally have to send the engineers to Germany and have them actually live it so they can actually uh, get a sense for how to design a car that will be good into those conditions, right? If you're trying to compete with Audi, with BMW and Germany, who, you know, Germany is their playground, right? That's, that's where they originally are from. And by the way, at the same time that you do that, you also have them uh, drive their cars uh, in the Nürburgring, which is, according to many uh, car enthusiasts, probably uh, one of the best tests of how good a car is from a uh, performance perspective, right? So it's the idea of going to the source of information instead of asking indirectly somebody. And sometimes that means that before you can get into somebody else's shoes, you need to take your own, right? So before you can walk into a customer, maybe you need to remove your preconceptions and try to understand really what's happening, which is hard, right? Another important aspect uh, that matters with whenever you're buying something is the idea of mood, right? Mood is a transient uh, affect, right? Something that it's temporal, something that changes uh, and for which there is no obvious uh, reason. And you can uh, describe the different activities that you're going to do from a shopping experience and, and classify them pretty clearly in terms of how you feel about them from a mood perspective by looking at whether they are two things. One is the degree of pleasure, which is captured here by this scale between the levels of pleasant and unpleasant, right? So this is something that will categorize different tasks, right? So maybe listening to the lecture is unpleasant, right? Maybe. And, right? And maybe... Uh, Eating a chocolate bar is pleasant, right? And then uh, you have this other dimension that matters for how you're going to feel, what your mood's going to be, like which is whether it's arousing or not, right? So is it something that is exciting, right? That's something that is pleasant and arousing, right? And, or something that is maybe pleasant but you know, low levels of arousal, which will be something that is relaxing, like maybe having coffee at Starbucks, like I was saying before, right? Uh, or you could have something that is unpleasant and arousing at the same time, like like a bad experience, I don't know, at the dentist, for example, right? Um, especially if it involves the drill, right? Uh, yeah, it sounds both unpleasant and arousing to me, at least. And you could have something that is unpleasant and gloomy, right? Like going to the DMV, right? So the different uh, emotions that we're going to feel are oftentimes going to be a function of the activity that we're going to be engaging in. So different shopping activities, whether it is for a new driver's license or, uh, I don't know, for a new implant in your, in your teeth, right? Uh, are going to have a very different emotional uh, reaction from the consumers and that's going to drive uh, how we go about uh, buying and how we feel about the outcome of the purchase. Okay, And one of the last things that I'm going to talk uh, in this particular presentation is motivation, right? Uh, not everybody feels the same about shopping in general, right? Some people just enjoy shopping maybe because of the social experiences associated with it. Like I was saying before, if you're shopping in a store, some people just enjoy talking to the salesperson, right? Some people hate it. I don't particularly like salespeople, but I'm just one guy, right? And other people really enjoy spending time with the person. Like, for example, one thing that I've noticed is uh, sometimes sadly, right? Uh, when people get into an older age, maybe they don't have as much social contact as they would like, maybe because they are limited or maybe because they are displaced, maybe because some of their friends are not around anymore. And what they will do is they will just go shopping uh, just to get some more contact. Like one thing you will see 
is people that go to the bank all the time to check their balance, right? And the only reason why they do it is because they want to talk to the bank teller. So they tell a couple of stories and, and they, they, they enjoy that interaction, right? And so that will be sh social experiences, although there are many, right? Um, also, shopping can actually uh, create groups, right? Uh, like, for example, if you are like me, if you like watches, right, and you collect watches, now suddenly there is a whole culture around watches, right? In fact, if they are expensive enough watches, then they are not watches anymore, right? Now they are timepieces. So uh, this common interest that you have can create uh, communities around that make the whole shopping experience a very different uh, where, for example, expertise is passed from, you know, uh, some members of the group to others, and also it can make it a lot more entertaining and exciting, right? Um, another thing that uh, changes the motivation for shopping is how the experience makes us feel. And one of the things that uh, salespeople are always trying to do, if they can, is try to make you feel important, right? Uh, and this can be achieved in different ways, but one of the ways in which you feel uh, important is when people know you, right? And they know what you like. So if you go to a particular Starbucks and they already know what you order, you get there, you don't even need to say what it is. They ask you, you know, what do you usually get? And you say yes, right? It makes you feel a little bit better, right? You have certain rapport with, with the customer. Um, another example of this that it's a little bit more sneaky I think is what the Mandarin Oriental does. It's a high uh, dollar uh, luxury hotel, right? And what they do is they have the person that helps you from the car, right? So there is a valet that will help you in the car, will ask you, oh, have you been here with us before? And then you will say yes or no, no big deal. But what that person does is in, then it makes a sign to the person at the checkout, uh, checkout, no, yeah, yeah, at the reception desk, right? Uh, telling them and showing them with maybe a finger or two fingers, whatever it is, right? They have agreed to a sign that tells the person uh, at the reception desk whether you have been here in the past or not. And if you have been here in the past, the way they will greet you is welcome back to the Mandarin Oriental, right? So it's kind of like they recognize that you were already there. So you're part of the family, you're part of the hotel, right? And this is obviously something that it's maybe hard to keep records of. And with this simple trick, you can just make people feel important. Okay, and something to think about. And obviously you can get uh, smart with this. And if technology is involved, this is a lot easier, right? So if it's something that, you know, you're keeping cookies, you know whether they've been there or not, if you're keeping track of who's purchasing what, the next time they come, you know that they are your customers, etc. So with technology, you can do a lot of this, sometimes even without technology. And then the last thing is some people just like finding stuff, right? They go shopping and it's, you know, it's like hunting, right? Trying to find a bargain or trying to find something new that they didn't know about. And that in itself is enjoyable for them. So their shopping experience is going to be different. And I've already talked a little bit about uh, online versus offline, but uh, obviously the whole experience is going to be very different, right? And nowadays that we are all to some degree uh, limiting our uh, traditional shopping and we're going a lot more online, you can see a lot of this, right? Um, everybody's shopping online to a larger or smaller degree. Um, what are the advantages of shopping online? Well, they are obvious, right? One, you get a lot more variety than you go to a store. So, for example, the other day, uh, I was trying to shop for skiing goggles, right? And I went to a store, REI, which has usually uh, products associated with the outdoors. So, I assume wrongly, that they will have skiing goggles. So I got there and I asked one of the attendants after browsing the store for about five minutes and not finding anything, if they had any skiing goggles. And he said, oh yeah, I think we have one over there by the bicycle helmets. And sure enough, there was literally one pair of ski goggles. So there was absolutely no variety. And 
And that's just the opposite to what happens when you type skin goggles at Amazon, right? Where you go through and you have 900 plus hits. I checked that yesterday, right? Uh, of different companies that sell you different products. So you can actually find a large variety of products. Okay. Then you have convenience, right? You don't even need to go to the store. You can shop in your PJs from your bed, you know, click, click, click. Uh, plus, you know, Amazon uh, was very smart 20 years ago to create customer profiles and customize the shopping experience and try to make it as easy for you as possible. And a lot of companies have copied this model, right? So now everybody, when you log into their website, they know who you are. They allow you to keep credit card information, etc., so that, you know, your whole electronic shopping experience is seamless. This was not typical 20 years ago, right? So convenience, uh, big plus, right? And potentially good customer service, right? Same thing with Amazon, and I have no affiliation with them. Uh, but the other day, for example, they sent me a package and it didn't make it here, and I clicked on their assistant, and within three clicks, they reship me another version of the same product and they didn't ask me to talk to anybody didn't give me a hard time etc that's not always what happens in every store right okay now what are the downsides well the first downside of shopping online is that you usually don't have direct access to the product or service right away this may be different depending on what you're talking about like for example with software you might be able to have direct access to software right away you can download it almost instantly with high speed connections However, uh, when it comes down to other products, like physical products, this is usually not the case. And that's one of the biggest headaches. This is why Amazon, again, um, has been pushing so hard to basically um, lower the amount of time it takes for the products to get to your door. And they have this whole drone uh, prototypes where they're trying to uh, deliver products to you within a two-hour window. We'll see if actually that gets approved because I can't even imagine all those drones flying all over the place, but maybe eventually will happen, right? Um, so that's a downside for online shopping. And then you have the obvious other issues, which is uh, fraud and uh, security, right? Um, although security is always an issue, but it's more of an issue when you're basically using your credit card online and any, anybody who knows what they're doing might be able to get access to it, even with encryption. And, and then shipping charges, right? Amazon also cracked this one by uh, providing a service that for high uh, usage rate people, so people that buy a lot from you, you have a flat fee that you charge them and that way any additional shipping charges are actually covered, right? And this enhances uh, the chances that anybody will go and shop with you because after they pay the flat fee, they don't feel like they are paying extra for shipping. And that's what I have for you guys for this one.